What's going on guys? I'm Jamari Bastillo from Morris High School. Thank you so much, Mona Golubek, for being here today. And yeah, hope you enjoy. Hi, I'm Patrick from Korea Middle School and I would like to welcome you to San Diego and I'm excited for your performance. Hi, I'm Jack from Korea Middle School and I'm really grateful to come and see your performance. Hi, I'm Kimi from Korea Middle School and I loved your book and I'm so excited to see your performance. Hi, I'm Abraham from Korea Middle School and I'm really looking forward to seeing your performance. Hello, my name is Brady and sitting me, I'm from Morris High School and I'm super excited for your performance today. Hey everyone, I'm Spencer. Welcome to this very special presentation of the Wilsden Reads program, created by the Hold On To Your Music Foundation and the USC Shoah Foundation. And I'm Sophie. We're honored to be here today with Mona Golubek, the celebrated concert pianist and acclaimed author and performer of the book we're going to be experiencing together today, The Children of Wilsden Lane. Hi, Mona. Well, hello there. Hi, Sophie. Hi, Spencer. It is so great to be with you here today. And to all of you out there, virtually, I am thrilled to be with you to share a story, the story of my mother. Mona, the book is amazing. I couldn't put it down. When did you first start to learn about your mother's childhood? So I was a little kid. My mom taught me the piano. She always said that each piece of music tells a story. Well, ironically, she told me her story through the music. And I was enchanted. It was a story of mysterious characters and a train ride that she had to take in order to be able to escape the persecution. She was Jewish. She was an Austrian young girl growing up in Vienna. The Nazis had come in, and so her parents decided to send her away. She never saw her parents again. Those were my grandparents. So I heard those stories when I was a little kid. But I don't think I really understood the magnitude of it, the seriousness of it, until much later in my life when I grew up. And I decided then that I wanted to write the book. And I began to understand how the music was so important for her. It, it not only saved her life, but it gave her the strength to face an uncertain future and challenges. That's what got her through. And now, through this book, and through the performance that I do, I get the opportunity to share my mother's story with so many across the world, to hear that message, that if you have something to hold on to in the darkest of times, you're gonna make it through. Mona, your mother's story really inspired me. What made you decide to write a book about it? So here I was a concert pianist, touring the world. It was glamorous, I saw a lot of interesting places, but I would always come off the tour and think, Something is missing in my life. I began to ask myself, what could I do that could maybe transform the world or inspire others? And that's when I remembered my mother's story. It all came flooding back to me, all the memories of those piano lessons. And I thought, if I could write a book, if I could get something out there, I could inspire so many young people and all of you out there to her message. What do you hold on to in the darkest of times? The message of fight for your dreams, no matter how difficult and no matter how hard the obstacles that come your way. Mona, what made you decide to turn the book into the theatrical performance we're going to see today? Yeah, so here the book came out and lots of people told me, well, you, you sort of have a gift as a storyteller. Have you thought about trying to bring it to the stage? It really would adapt well in that way. Well, my path crossed with a great director-producer named Hershey Felder. He fell in love with the book, and he decided to take a chance on me. I really didn't know about acting. I really didn't know about the theater. But I had a fire in my heart. I had a dream. So he gave me a shot, and I studied acting. And then he got me an audition at a major playhouse in Los Angeles. I remember being very nervous opening night, <laughs> but walking out there and saying, I got to tell this story, and the rest was history for me. Mona, you've been doing the Wilston Reads program for a few years now. I think in the past you traveled to different cities, and you brought students to the theater to see the performance. But today, we're going to do that a little different. Absolutely. Usually, everyone comes inside the theater, right? But today, we're bringing the theater to you, all of you. We filmed the show at the Saban Theater, 
an historic theater in Los Angeles, beautiful theater, Art Deco, built in the 1930s, which is the same time period that Lisa's story takes place in, back in Vienna, Austria. Let me say no more. Let's go to act one, the children of Wilsden Lane. It's Vienna, 1938, a Friday afternoon. Lisa Jura is 14 years old. And like every Friday afternoon, she's preparing for the most important hour of her week. Her piano lesson. She slips out of the apartment, hurries down the block and boards the trolley. She loves the ride. The magical images rush by her window as the trolley takes her over the Danube River to the center of the city. And to go across the city is to enter another century. The era of grand palaces, stately ballrooms, the spire of St. Stephen's Cathedral rises to the heavens like a castle in a fairy tale. This is the Vienna of Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Mahler, the greatest composers of all time. She can hear their music in the stones of the streets and the marble of the buildings. One day, when she will make her debut, all this will be hers. As the streetcar descends the broad avenue and passes Symphony Hall, Lisa closes her eyes just as she does every Friday and imagines that she's on the stage of the Great Hall about to make her debut in the Grieg Piano Concerto. She's prepared for this moment her entire life. A hush falls over the audience. She straightens her back into the perfect posture that her mother has taught her. When the tension is unbearable, she takes a breath and... Trolley begins to slow down. Her stop is approaching. She's still lost in her dream. When Lise arrived at her stop last week, it was called Mahlerstrasse, named for Gustav Mahler, the Jewish composer. But this week the name was different. It was no longer Jewish, it was German. And everything was different. She walked up the steps to the studio of her teacher. He opened the door. Now, usually, they would bow to each other. But today, he opened the door and was staring at the floor. He said nothing. So she began the lesson. She played this piece that I'm playing for you right now. It's called the Moonlight Sonata of Beethoven. And if you listen carefully, you can hear how old world it sounds. It takes you back to another time. The professor would sit next to her with the score on his lap. He would wave his hands in the air. He would sing along completely out of tune. But today there was nothing.
Professor Isilis, is everything all right? No, Lisa, nothing is right. There is a new ordinance. Teaching a Jewish child is now forbidden. There will be no lesson today. There will be no lessons anymore. I'm so sorry. I'm not a brave man. And he turned and walked to his bedroom, closed his door, leaving Lisa all alone. She memorized every detail of that studio. She looked one last time at his piano. She must have known she would never see the piano or him again. Then she left. Well, now the magic of the ride was gone, and she could see the darkness that was taking over her city. The Nazi soldiers everywhere with armbands and rifles, and the music that she loved, it was crashing inside of her. Somehow she managed to get home, went straight into the apartment, sat down at the piano, and cried. Lisa had the most wonderful family. Her two sisters, Rosie and Sonia. Sonia was 12, Rosie was 17. Her mother, Malka, and her father, Abraham. Abraham called himself the finest tailor in all of Vienna, and his customers came from all over the city to have their suits custom made. But now he didn't have any work because his was a Jewish business, and out of desperation to provide for the family, he had turned to gambling which kept him away from their home. And on November 9th, 1938, Lisa's father didn't come home at all. Gangs of Nazis roamed the city. They smashed the windows of Jewish businesses and Jewish homes. They burned books and Torah scrolls. Lisa stood by the window, waiting for her papa. Then she saw him. The Nazis were beating him. They were forcing him down on his knees, making him scrub the filthy pavement, while they laughed and yelled. Juden Schwein, Jewish pig. Suddenly, the door opened. There he was. His face was dirty. His beautiful white shirt was bloodstained and torn. His trousers had been ripped. And in his hand was a crumpled piece of paper that he offered to Malka as a gift. Abraham, how could you go out at night time and gamble? How dare you? Not only do you put your own life in their hands, but your children's and mine as well. What is wrong with you? Malka, they took our clothes. They made us dance naked in the street. They laughed as they watched us scramble like wild mice to get our belongings. I needed to find my coat. Inside the coat was this ticket, a ticket to freedom, a place on the kinder transport, Malka, the kinder transport. Everyone in Vienna had been talking about the kinder transport, the children's train. You see, far away in England, British citizens Jews and Christians alike, sensing terrible tragedy, pressured their government to allow transports of thousands of Jewish children to come out from Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and come all the way to England to be placed in homes and farms and hostels. Every Jewish family in Vienna was desperate to get a place on one of those trains to save their child. And now Lisa's father had managed to get one place on one of those trains. Abraham, you can't possibly be thinking of separating us from the children. And what will you do, send one? Which daughter will you choose? You will not do this, I will not let you. Malka, it is too dangerous to allow 
our daughters to remain here in Vienna. Every day, more and more Jews are being arrested and disappearing. We can send them to England. They will be safe there. What them? You have only one ticket. Which daughter would they choose? Lisa couldn't listen anymore. So she escaped to the only safe place that she knew. She played this very piece that I'm playing for you right now. It's called Claire de Lune. It means moonlight. The professor told her that she was playing it beautifully and that if she worked as hard on the Grieg piano concerto as she had done on this piece, then one day, a long time from now, maybe, she would make her debut in that great work. And when she looked up, she saw her mother, her father, her sisters, Rosie and Sonia, standing right here, watching, listening. Malka came over to Lisa, placed her hands on Lisa's shoulder, she turned, she saw the tears in her mother's eyes. And she knew they had chosen her. They were going to send her away. She started to cry. But then Malka said it was a chance for her to have a new teacher, an English piano teacher in London where there were no ordinances against the Jews, and that in no time the family would follow. She was somewhat excited, a new teacher, the Grieg, but her family, how could she leave them? People were disappearing. What would give her the strength to get on that train and say goodbye? The Westbahnhof, the train station, was so crowded. Hundreds of desperate families, panicked, pushing. Lisa's father was crying, something she had never seen him do before. Malka walked her for the final goodbye. You must make me a promise. Promise me that you will hold on to your music, and I'll be with you every step of the way through the music, with every beat, with every phrase, with every note, my darling. I will be with you. Lisa closed her eyes. She didn't want her mother to see that she was crying. Then someone was pushing her. Stop pushing me. Why are you pushing me? Mama, hold my hand tighter than people pushing. Stop pushing me. Mama. It all happened so fast. The force of the crowd swept Lisa away from her family onto the waiting train. The heavy brakes gave way. She saw the steam come through the tracks as they lurched forward. She pressed her face against the window. She waved frantically and thought that she could see her family but wasn't sure. 
As the train rolled out of the station, she looked out, and the Vienna that she knew and the family that she loved were gone. Wow, Mona, that was an amazing first act. I mean, at times I felt like I was living this experience right with Lisa. Do you remember the first time you heard your mom tell this story? Yeah, I was little. I was six or seven. I, it was in those piano lessons. I was enthralled. It was a mysterious story and full of adventure and mysterious characters. And that train ride, the kinder transport that took her to safety and took her away from everything that she loved into a country where she knew no one. Mona, could you tell us more about the kinder transport? Great question, Spencer. The kinder transport really means children train. And it was this rescue operation that was set up. It kind of started back in Great Britain when they heard about all the horrible things that were happening to the Jewish children across Europe. These wonderful people, Wonderful Christians came together with British Jews to create this rescue operation and to provide for homes in England once the kids would come out of their countries on these trains to England. This rescue operation saved nearly 10,000 children. It was a short period of time. It only went up to when the war was declared. But one of those children was my mother. Mona, part of what makes Lisa's story so amazing is the music. Yeah. We have a question about the music from one of the students watching along with us. Mona, what is your mother's favorite piece of music to play? Another great question. I think probably her favorite piece of music was the Claire de Lune by the French composer Claude Debussy. Claire de Lune means moonlight, and it's very soothing, it's very peaceful, as you can tell. And I'd like to think that maybe it soothed her heart as the world was crumbling around her. I mean, music was kind of like a magic carpet for her. It took her to another place, and it gave her the strength to find the resilience within herself to face an uncertain future and go for her dreams. Music was everything for her. We'll have more studio questions when we return after the second act. Mona, could you give us a preview of what we're going to see next? Act two. Lisa's on the train. She's arriving in London, a strange new place. She's going to need to hold on to her music more than ever as she faces obstacles that comes her way and meets mysterious characters. And as you watch act two, I'd love you to think about what do you hold on to? in the darkest of times, the challenges that come your way. I'd like to find out when we finish viewing act two. So let's go, the children of Wilsden Lane. Lisa was on the kinder transport now, surrounded by hundreds of boys and girls, all strangers. Everyone had a number around their neck. Hers was 158. They crossed the English Channel one more train ride, and they arrived at the Liverpool Street Station in London. Now, as they were ushered off of that train and put into long lines, members of the Jewish Refugee Agency began calling out names and numbers. Emil Schwartz, 122. Ava Cohen, 98. The names and numbers went on for hours. Finally, Lisa Jura, 158. She looked over and saw a tall man holding a clipboard walking right up to her. 158, Lisa Jura. Young lady, I'm from the rescue operation and it's my job to place you. What skills do you have? Sir, I play the piano. I'm going to be 15 years old. I need to save my family. I need to bring them here to London. I'm going to make something of my life, and I need you to help me. His name was Mr. Hardesty. He was the director in charge of 10,000 Jewish refugee children. He took Lisa into a cab. They motored to the northern part of London. 
The cab stopped in front of 243 Wilsden Lane, a hostel that housed 30 Jewish refugee children. Mr. Hardesty opened the door. They walked up the steps. Lisa saw a rambling brick structure with a garden full of lilacs. Mr. Hardesty knocked, and a middle-aged woman, Mrs. Cohen, opened the door and looked at Lisa's suitcase. So, is that all you have? Lisa told her that it was. Come in, then. Let's not stand here while the house fills up mid flies. We're overcrowded. We can only make room for you for a short while. Uh, Gina will give you all the rules. Rules? Lisa didn't care about any rules. Because in that moment when she entered the living room and looked in the far corner, she saw a distinctive, familiar object. Mr. Hardesty stood frozen. Mrs. Cohen sat down in a chair in disbelief. And then, one by one, the children came out of their rooms. There were dozens of them. They stood on the staircase, watching and listening to Lisa. Each piece of music tells a story. And in that moment, Lisa's music told the story of their lives. Their families, their parents, their brothers and sisters. And then, one of the girls ran up to her. Hi, Lisa, I'm Gina. I'm from Vienna, just like you, and I'm here to give you the rules of the hostel. Now, there's 17 girls here, 13 boys. We girls have only one bathroom. We are not allowed to use the boys' bathroom upstairs, even if we're dying. Curfew's at 10 o'clock, lights out at 10.30, no food is allowed in the bedrooms. That girl is Edith, she's from Mannheim. The boy with the cane, that's Mrs. Cohen's blind son, Hans. That's Reuben, that's Shepsel, that's Hannah. She's my best friend, at least for today. And do you see the three boys in the corner? Well, the tall one is Johnny King Kong. We call him that because he's so big and strong. The handsome blonde is Aaron. And the cute shy one is Gunther. He's the one I like. Lisa was intrigued by the handsome boy named Aaron. And Gina, she became her best friend. She got her a job working long hours in the factories, Plotz and Sons, making uniforms for the military. The war was coming. Going to work, sewing for long hours, and returning to the hostel on Wilsden Lane became Lisa's life. One year later, England was plunged into the darkest days its people would ever know. Every night as the sirens began screaming and the blackout curtains were closed, Mrs. Cohen would scramble the children into the bomb shelter next door. And in the commotion, no one noticed that Lisa had stayed behind to go down into the basement where the piano had been placed for safekeeping. The bombings began and it was terrifying. But every night she went down into that basement and pounded the cadenza of the Grieg piano concerto. Every night, determined to keep her promise to her mother.
that night the hostel was bombed, destroyed. Everyone had to go live somewhere else. What would happen to them now? Another year passed. Mrs. Cohen managed to rebuild the hostel. She brought everyone back. One night, Mrs. Cohen summoned Lisa to her bedroom. Handed her a clipping from the newspaper. January 15, 1942, the Evening Standard. Auditions for scholarships in all instruments at the London Royal Academy of Music. The Royal Academy, where all the greats study. But Mrs. Cohen, why would the Academy accept me, a Jewish refugee? And how will I prepare without a proper piano, no music, no teacher? Never mind, Mrs. Cohen said. And with that, she corralled the entire gang and assigned a different responsibility to each one. Lisa would come home from a long day at the factory, go down into the basement, and plunge into the routine. Gunter would call out the names of notes to which she was to play the corresponding scale. C. G. Gina would strike two notes and ask her to identify the correct interval. Major third, Johnny would order her to play the scherzo of Chopin, and Hans would tap his cane. admonishing her to keep a steady beat. Don't rush. You're rushing. You're rushing. And so it went, every day. Finally, the day of the audition arrived, and Gunther took the day off of work to accompany her. They entered the Royal Academy of Music. There were long lines of smartly dressed teenagers accompanied by their parents. Lisa was so nervous, she desperately wished that her mother was standing right here, holding her hand. Then she heard her name. Lisa Yura. It was her turn. She entered the hall, walked over to the piano, sat down, and played her heart out. And when the audition was over, Gunther was waiting for her. How did it go, Lisa? Well, I gave it my best. We all gave it our best, Gunther. The war was at its most violent now, and Lisa worked longer hours at the factory. And while she sewed, her thoughts were constantly about the audition and the results. She waited for a letter from the Royal Academy of Music. She waited for a letter from her parents. She waited for something, anything. Very few letters came any longer to the hostel. But one day, a letter did come. And Mrs. Cohen said to Lisa, This letter has come for you. May I? The Associated Board of the Royal Academy of Music is pleased to inform Miss Lisa Yora that she has been accepted into the study of the pianoforte. Time passed again, and soon Lisa was coming to the end of her third year of studies at the academy. And at her last lesson, her teacher told her that she was ready for her debut in the Grieg Piano Concerto. And this was the moment she had waited for her entire life, what she had dreamed about. Just as she was imagining her debut, bells began to ring. And they could see through the windows that the streets were filling up with thousands of people who were shouting for joy. The war was over. She said goodbye to her teacher. She made her way through the cheering crowds. She finally got home to Wilsden Lane, where she found everyone gathered in the living room. And one by one, they asked the questions that they had avoided all those years. Where do we go now? What will become of us? Does anyone know where there's information about our families?
When the Auschwitz concentration camp was liberated, the world learned the truth. Where were the families of the thousands of children who had come out on the kinder transports? Where was Lisa's family? Were they even alive? There were lists, there were names. She went every day to the Red Cross and to the Jewish refugee agency. She searched the lists of liberated concentration camp survivors, the names of displaced persons over and over. As Europe rebuilt from its ashes, Lisa went every day desperately searching for a Jura, for someone who knew her family. Finding no one. What happened to Lisa, her family, her friends? How did her story end? Did she fulfill her dream? Lisa did hold on to her music. She fulfilled her dream. She walked out on that stage and made her debut in the Grieg Piano Concerto on a stage in London after the war. And when I wrote the book, I wondered, what was she feeling that night when she walked out on stage? What was in her heart? This is what I imagined. Lisa's chords were somber yet noble. As she played, she imagined her mother lighting the Shabbos candles and her father reading a prayer. Then she sent her music across the footlights into the hearts of all who had come that night. She saw their shining eyes. And in that moment, she knew that her mother would always be with her through the music. Well, my friends, the little girl who was sent away and told to hold on to her music was Lisa Yura. And as you know, she was my mother. Lisa held on to her dream. Now it's your turn.
Mona, your mother's story and your performance of it are so powerful, it literally gave me chills. What does being the daughter of a survivor mean to you? It's a very beautiful question. I'm not only the daughter of a survivor, I'm the daughter of a refugee. And that means the world to me. It's defined my life. It's, it's given me purpose. When I think about my mother's story and when I knew about it, I'm so moved by the strength of my mother, the courage of my mother, to hold on to something in the darkest of times and make something of her life despite all those obstacles. I wanted to go out there and make a difference also and share her story with so many like all of you. That's the honor of being a daughter of a survivor and of a refugee. Mona, why do you think it's important for students to study history and learn from the past? Aren't we seeing today the chaos and the division in our world, which harkens back to Lisa's story? If ever there was a story that we should pay attention to, it's that story, because it has so much meaning to today. Why? Well, Lisa had to dig deep inside herself to find the resilience to face all those obstacles, all those things that were thrown at her. That's the message for all of us today. That's why this story is so important. That's why it's so important to study history. Because maybe one day we won't see history repeating itself. It'll be a different world. Mona, how can students like us stand up to hate in our own communities? The power of one story to change the world, the power of one person to change the world, it takes guts, it takes courage. I mean, think about it, think about our world. The chaos, the fighting, social media pressure, pressure from your peers, in your schools, but deep down that you know, you know what is right and wrong inside yourself, inside your heart, inside your soul. So take that first step and stand up for what's right in your world. I promise you, if you dig deep inside and find that courage, you will make a difference. Okay, it's my turn to ask both of you some questions. Spencer, you're first. What's the thing you hold on to? What, what gets you through those tough times? Well, me personally, I have faith in God and I have faith that I have a path set out to me and that I should just follow my goals and that I have role models and people that can help me get to my goals. So family, right? Yeah. Very strong family ties and, uh, and faith in God. Of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So Sophie, what do you hold on to? Personally, one thing that I hold on to to get me through my difficult times is writing. Uh, just to have like a safe space, like a journal to keep my thoughts in just helps me get through whatever it is I may be going through, as well as like it keeps me present um, while still being able to look back at the past and kind of gain new perspective. So whether it be school or world or personal concerns, my journal's just always open. That's amazing because writing really centers you mm -hmm. and you, you commit yeah. to that and you kind of, it's, it's almost your heart on the page yeah. there yeah. to put your thoughts down. Mm -hmm. Spencer, Sophie, it was great being with you. And I really hope that my mother's story entered your heart and you learned from her today. We definitely have, Mona, thank you. And to all the students and teachers out there, thank you so much. Let me leave you with this one thought. For Lisa, it wasn't just about surviving. It was about how did she want to live her life? And as you prepare to move forward in the world, think about what you hope to achieve and always hold on to your dreams. Thank you. Hi, my name is Romeo Duque. I'm from Morris High School. And during difficult times, I draw my strength by always reminding myself to push through for my family, especially for my little brother. I'm Whitney from Korea Middle School, and in difficult times, I keep a hold of my family and the people around me. Hi, I'm Charlie from Korea Middle School, and things that help me through tough times are my dogs. 
I'm Michaela from Korea Middle School, and something that helps me throughout tough times are the people I love and can talk to. Hi, I'm Ryder from Korea Middle School. In a hard time, I like to hold on to biking and my friends. During difficult times, art is an outlet that I turn to. It allows me to express myself without any boundaries, and it comforts me if I feel stressed or upset.